is put a beaker up on top so that it can rest uh, without having the potential to fall. And so uh, that's one way of using the ring stand. So we have the ring stand. Easy to remember because a lot of times you'll have a ring on it and it stands up straight. And then uh, we have the triangle, which that's pretty easy to remember as well, or ceramic triangle, okay? I think there's some other names that other people use, but that's the one I tend to use. Uh, this is a beaker. These come in small sizes all the way up to really big sizes. And the beaker is also a way to measure volume. It's not as accurate as a graduated cylinder because a graduated cylinder has more lines to measure with. This one, if you notice, starts at 50. So this is not even accurate until I get enough liquid in here that gets you up to 50. Uh, you can also measure volumes of, of solids like uh, salt or sugar in here too. Um, but it, volume, remember, is how much space something occupies, okay? Now, if you notice, it goes from 50 to 100 on the big lines right Good here. Good morning, Ronald okay. Mark. Please stand for the budget. Okay, so uh, the beaker is a way of measuring volume. And volume, of course, is being able to measure how much space something takes up. If you notice, this one right here starts at 50. And so this beaker is not accurate until you at least have 50 milliliters of a substance in here. And so if you notice, the numbers go from 50, and the big one is 100, 150, 200, 250. So this is accurate up to 250 milliliters when you measure. If you notice, there are half spaces here. So it goes 50, half space, 100, half space, 150. So each half space is going up by 25. So it's going to go 50, 75, 100, 125, 150, 175, 200, 225, 250. Now if you notice if the liquid or substance that you might have in here that you're measuring volume falls between those lines, then it's not accurate. Even when it hits the line, sometimes uh, if it's a powder especially, it won't lay flat. And so you're kind of, it's kind of a rough estimate. It's not as accurate as say a graduated cylinder would be. Graduated cylinders have lots of lines so you're allowed to measure much more precisely, okay? And precise means dead on, okay? Precise is dead on. Okay, so let's look at some other things. Here we have a couple things here. This is a test tube, okay? Test tubes are used to uh, put liquids in or we could create a solution by dissolving or uh, um, creating chemical reactions in here um, of substances. And so we often use these with... Uh, with uh, Bunsen burners to warm things up to help speed up the process of a reaction or to uh, help to dissolve a substance. Heat will always help dissolve as well as shaking or stirring. Anything we can do to help create more surface area for the substance or to get the uh, temperatures up so that it uh, moves things quicker will help to dissolve a substance faster. Now uh, here we have a, a set of tongs. If you notice they're always clamped shut and that's because they hold on to test tubes. Test tubes won't rest on the bottom, so they have to have something to hold them up. So when we, we use a beaker, I mean a Bunsen burner with a, t uh, with a test tube, we need to protect our hands, so this will help us to do that. And we always aim the, the mouth of a test tube away from us and other people because fumes will come out of here, gases, as well as uh, hot substances, especially if you're heating them up. Or if you have a reaction that actually is uh, exothermic. An exothermic reaction gives off heat and energy, and so sometimes that comes off out, the, out the, uh, the, the, the top part of this test tube, so we always face it away from us and others. Okay, test tubes can be really hard to clean because you really can't get your fingers down in there whenever you're trying to clean them in the sink, and so we have test tube brushes that allow us to get far down in there and really get them cleaned out. Uh, you can use these also for graduated cylinders, okay? So that's how those work. Okay, because I said test tubes can't rest on their bottom, we need ways to be able to hold them up so when we work with them, they're not falling over all the time. Uh, we could also use smaller rubber stoppers, too. This one's too big, but we can use them to fit inside of here to, to close up the contents. But this is a test tube rack. This one will hold one, two, three, four, five, six test tubes. They make them much bigger. They make them in different sizes and shapes, but essentially they all do the same thing. They're meant to hold the test tube upright. Uh, whenever you're cleaning a test tube, uh, you can always use your rack to hold these like this so that they can dry out upside down and all the liquid you know, runs to the bottom and comes out. Okay. We talked about a microscope earlier. 
microscopes are essentially not any good unless you have something to look at. So what we put specimens on, whether there's cheek cells or bacteria samples or blood smears or uh, whatever you're wanting to look at, stuff that's really small, too small for the human eye to see very specifically. So we can put the specimens on a microscope slide. And uh, once the specimen is there, we can use the cover slip. It's another little piece of glass. Sometimes it's a piece of plastic. But we can lay that on top, and that helps to adhere the specimen to the slide. Okay, It also protects it because you're always handling these things, and you really don't want to be touching the organisms that's on here. Okay, So that was a, a microscope slide and a cover slip. Okay. Um, this is a lot like uh, one of these. If you remember, this was a micro well uh, container to be able to do different lab samples and testing. This is a Petri dish. Petri dishes also have a cover to help protect the contents inside from contamination, which means we don't want other outside substances coming in contact with what we have going on here. Uh, we don't want interference with our lab results. Uh, we often can look at pond water samples. There are certain microscopes where we can put pond water in here and we can put it underneath and we can see the organisms swimming around inside. Uh, I don't have one of those microscopes in this particular lab, but they're out there. Uh, we can also grow bacteria samples. We need to put an auger in here. And an auger is simply a substance, kind of like a jelly substance, that we can put in here that has nutrients for bacteria and other organisms to grow. And so, depending on what you're trying to grow, will determine what kind of auger you have to put. The auger has to have all the nutrients necessary for growth. And so we can put the auger in here, let it solidify, then we can take a sample of the bacteria. Let's say we wanted to take a sample of the bacteria on a desk. We could rub a, a cotton swab or something on there, then smear it on the auger, cover it up, put it in an incubator, which is like a, a, an oven that runs at a really low temperature. It just allows it to stay at a constant temperature that's conducive or, or, or it's the type of temperature where bacteria loves to grow. And we'll put it in there, let it sit for 24 hours or 48 hours, whatever it takes, and then we'll see the colonies start to develop here. Then what's really cool about that is you can take those colonies of bacteria that are growing or spores or whatever it might be and you can take them off, put them on a microscope slide and then view them under a microscope and you can identify what they are based upon their characteristics. Okay, okay so this is a triple beam balance. Most everybody's used one of these before. Uh, triple beam balances have three beams. Okay, that's why we call it triple beam. The triple beam balance is accurate to uh, let's see, it goes from 0 to 1 grams. But if you notice, there's little bitty lines between uh, this smaller measurement. And so each one of those counts for something, right? So each one of those is, there's 10 of those. And so it's, it's accurate to 0 0.1 gram, okay? So we could be measuring something all the way from, see, this big weight goes to 500, this one goes to 100, and this one goes to 10. So if we add them together, 500 plus 100 is 600, plus 10 is 610. So this is accurate to 610 grams. So we can weigh something that's that massive. But we also can come all the way down to something that's as small as 0.1 grams and get an accurate measurement. Anything between those points, like 0 0.01, 0 0.02, we have to guess. But it's a small guess, so it's pretty accurate. This is a really accurate scale. Uh, the problem with this is that we don't use these too much in lab settings anymore. There's much more accuracy in digital uh, scales, so we tend to use those more. This is more old school, okay? But you still have to know it for uh, middle school and high school. They want you to know how to use these. Um, but in, re in reality, when you get in the real world, uh, you'd kind of be laughed at if you were using one of these in industry somewhere because they now use uh, very, very accurate uh, that, that measure like to the .0001 uh, grams. So they're much more accurate than these. There's lots less human error, okay? And we really want that when we're talking about health care, uh, medicines, people's lives. We want to make sure we can be as accurate as we possibly can. Okay, this is a syringe. A lot of students like to call it a shot. A shot is actually what you get or an injection. Uh, this is just a syringe. Uh, we use them for lots of things in science. We don't necessarily need to put a needle on there. We can use these to uh, pump uh, air and put pressure on a hose uh, to create some sort of hydraulic system. That would be in physics. We can use these to uh, remove uh, liquid substances and, and transfer it from one place to another. 
These are also, if you notice, there's measurements here. And these are cubic uh, centimeters or milliliters, okay? So these are still milliliters, or you can say cubic centimeters, okay? Um, and so this is accurate up to 12 milliliters, okay? If you notice this graduated cylinder, it was accurate starting to 5. There's no line until you hit 5, and it goes all the way up to 50. This one will get you all the way up to 12, okay? And you just take the plunger, and when you see the bottom of the plunger hit that line, then that's where your uh, liquid volume is, okay? Or air. You can do air, too. Okay, this is called a watch glass. We use these for lots of different things. We can have different samples of substances laying out and on these. Uh, we can actually use these to evaporate things. So if we have salt water or uh, sugar water, which is a mixture, it can be easily separated. It's not a compound. And so if we have uh, a few drops of salt water sitting here, and we just want to see if there's any solid substances there after it evaporates, because you can't look at salt water if it's dissolved completely and tell what it is. You can taste it, but we can't taste things in science. So let's say we have water and we want to see how pure it is as far as solid substances. So we might put a medicine dropper and take some water out of this beaker, and then we might squirt it on this watch glass and let it sit out. And we might just let it evaporate off, let the water just naturally evaporate. And then we'll look at it and see if there's any solid substances remaining on this glass. And so this is called a watch glass, okay? Okay, safety first, right? Here's a lab apron. This is going to protect your clothing, protect your skin. There's different types, uh, depending on what you have. Uh, this one's good for chemical splashes and things like that. However, if you're dealing with hot substances that are popping, you know, like uh, let's say you were melting metal or something like that, this wouldn't protect you much because this would melt immediately if a piece of metal would come off on you. So you wouldn't use this like in uh, an ag where you're welding and stuff because the sparks and the hot hot parts that would pop back at you would actually melt this. Okay, but it is a good chemical apron. Okay. Uh, safety goggles. Um, students tend to put these on and then take them like this during the lab. We don't ever want to see that. We don't want to protect our forehead. We want to protect our eyes. Uh, we do have vents on these where you open them up. We don't pull them off, but the vents allow air to come in and out of the goggles so they don't fog up. Also allows your eyes to feel a little more rested when there's some oxygen moving around in there. Uh, but this is a chemical splash goggle. It allows us to work with chemicals, and if it splashed back, so it's not going to get in our eyes. Okay? Okay, finally, the last thing is right here. Okay, this is what we use in middle school instead of uh, the beaker. I mean, I'm sorry, the Bunsen burner. Uh, we don't use these because of the flame, uh, the flame uh, problems that come with these. But hot plates are treated just as safely, okay? You never know if they're on because the only thing that lets us know is a, a little light that comes on. But sometimes that light may be broken. So we always treat these as though they're hot, okay? Um, even if they're unplugged, you don't know if somebody might have just unplugged them because if you notice, there's a handprint right here on the top. And a student actually pointed this out to me yesterday. Uh, that's actually the imprint of a glove, so they must have had a heat glove and they were just messing around or something, but they touched the top of it and it was hot enough that it burned uh, the, uh, the texture that was on the gloves to the top of this hot plate. So I don't know if somebody was just messing around and wanted to see how good their glove was or what, but you can see that uh, whatever happened here uh, could have created an injury if they didn't have their hand, uh, hand covered up. It could have still caused an injury, but we always treat these like they're hot and they get hot really, really fast. Okay, well that's the, uh, that's the bulk of our material. There may be a few little other things, but this would be what would show up on your exam. So review this video as often as you would like. Um, I would encourage you to do so just because it's a great review. And I uh, wish you good luck on your practical.